Day. Um, my name is Virginia Abazifuni Mabaso, aka Funi M. I um, was born and raised in Limpopo in the small village called Mandara village in the greater far north of Limpopo. Grew up there, started my school there and uh, as kids we moved out quite a lot to Alex and uh, in between um, Alex and, and the village until when I was starting my metric that I had to be um, based uh, full time in, in Limpopo. I started my high school in Piri Piri Secondary School. You know, current experience that I have been through, you know, I'm a mother. I would be a mother of two. Um, I'm a mother to now a 20 year old boy, Mugundi. And uh, unfortunately, January 2018, on the 20th, my identity, as I say, it has been changed. Um, you know, you wait 20 years to have your second born, mainly because of personal reasons, of course. But when I realized that I was expecting, I didn't even think twice. You know, I'm an unmarried single parent at the time in a relationship. And when I realized that I was expecting baby O, um, I named him the day I had his heartbeat for the first time. You know, I, I knew that it was that um, blessing on um, Donda. That means that God has blessed me. So the day I had um, baby O's heartbeat for the first time, I knew that this is it. Um, I've made a decision that I will carry this baby, enjoy this pregnancy and, and just enjoy the season that I was in at the time. Nine months, you would say it's a long period, but nine months now that I look back, I would say I wish God could have extended nine months to be longer so that I would have had and I some more experience and more memories with, with baby O in, in me. So had a very healthy pregnancy, no sickness, no morning sickness, nothing. Each time I went for a checkup, it would be that exciting thing that I'm gonna see my baby, I'm gonna see my baby moving me, I'm gonna see my baby look like me even more every time. Um, no signs or no hint to say anything unfortunate would actually follow. Went through the entire pregnancy. I was overdue by a week. So when I went to hospital, they said, no, let's give it another week. If you still not um, go into labor in this coming week, then we will induce. I agreed to that. Um, and even then, when the baby's pulse were checked full, it passed everything, all the tests were positive, everything was, was great, I was still feeling fine, you no know, pressure. I was even still wearing my makeup and looking all cute when I was going to hospital and all the nurses would be like, oh my goodness, you, you still have so much energy in, in like nine months. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Baby all keeps me up. You know, so they would laugh at the fact that I've already made, uh, named the baby and already it's like a baby that has already been born because the relationship is just already had started, you know. Um, already I had created a baby range for him, you know, return baby all, all the blankets and everything. It was just perfectly ready, you know. But come the, the 19th of January when I went to hospital for induction, um, I was checked. Everything was perfect, was admitted. Um, yeah, this was heavy. And I must say that this is the first time that I really open up about the day. So the 19th, I get admitted um, in perfect health as, as, as I've been the nine months. And um, the 20th in the morning, 5 a.m., um, then the labor pain started. So I progressed quite quickly and when at, at half past seven, I remember um, one of the nurses is like, no, she, she has progressed quite quickly. And it's like when I was checked, the first nurse said, no, she's like two centimeters away. But I could see these constructions. I could feel the construction are, are so abnormal. They're coming and it's so unbearable to a point where I couldn't breathe. So they take me into delivery room and one of the nurses check, uh, checks me to say no but she is like already eight centimeters and I was checked not so long ago you know so anyway um, 
I was then put on a machine to, to, to check the baby's heartbeat. Everything was still perfect. I was still fine. I was still very strong. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm expectant to, to, to meet my baby all. And um, when I was fully dilated and um, the nurse then comes in um, to start pushing, we, we get into the whole pushing process now. But I could feel after 10 minutes that something is not happening right, you know. Then I asked the nurse for the first time to say, can I kindly um, sign for a C-section because I can feel that something is terribly wrong. And um, the nurse was very rude and she was like, no, um, natural birth, that's the only way to bring a child into this earth. So I carried on, I was giving it my all, everything that I had in me because I, I didn't want anything bad to go on. And after 10 minutes again, I asked her, now I'm crying because I could feel that I'm also losing strength. And I asked her again, she walked out of the room, she left me unattended. And uh, there I am. And um, you know, the, the, the baby's head is, had already started crowning. And one of the, of the student doctors um, came in now, they uh, trying to, to push and um, the doctor, one of the doctors from theater who just passed by and she's like, no, checking the time that I entered the delivery room. And what was the time at that point? He's like, no, this person has been here for too long. You know, so they, they trying to do the pump pressure on me. And I'm like trying to push them away because at that position, the baby's head had already started crowning fully and I, I'm losing strength and they now start putting oxygen on me and um, it was now the situation has escalated and even then in my silent voice I asked for a c-section immediately but it was uh, excuse me so they now started to to prepare me for theater um, started doing all the re testing me for HIV and AIDS, and the student doctors um, now taking all the all the vitals tests, and uh, I was willed to 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 theater. So I'm I'm trying to to stay awake um, just for my baby at that time, holding on with the last strength that I had. And when I got to theater, the nurse that was um, helping with my delivery, she, she has to take me through theater and give a report as to what had happened. And obviously through delivery, they must be noting the stages of delivery. But then in her root character, she refused to go into into theater with me one of the nurses that admitted me on the 19th she's the one she's like no i know this child i'm the one who admitted her so the delivery nurse refused to to come in into theater and um the the nurse who admitted me then um stepped in and then took me in so when we get there, you know, when you're doing a, a C-section, now it, this is, a, is not an ordinary C-section anymore because the baby's head had already started crowning. I can't sit up straight for a spine injection. They had to prick me like over three times to find the right spot. And at that time, I'm still praying in silence to like, God, whatever you do. So eventually, they uh, they find the right spot on my spine. They inject me, and now my blood pressure. I'm normally, I'm a low blood pressure person, but my blood pressure at that time started to be sky high, and uh, I was feeling extra cold. So they put um, the theater heaters one on the side, and I was still feeling 
very cold and put another one and my blood pressure was not um, coming down and started putting all the drips on me I had like about six drips on my body at the time so they they do a section it was quick to take the baby out hear the little cry and we when they took the baby to it's like a table where they, they prepare him and that but all of a sudden I hear silence and the entire theater room is so silent the only doctor that is talking to me is the one that is the anesthetic doctor who's now worried about my blood pressure because as everybody went silent I don't know what was happening with my system but that blood pressure kept on being sky high and I was freezing cold at the time and he's the one who's talking to me to keep me awake and uh, but I'm not even paying attention to him. I'm, I'm interested to, to hearing another cry. I'm interested to know, to hear someone says, here's your baby. I just, I just was interested to see on the other side, but I couldn't see what was going on on the other side. And everybody started talking um, through eyes. The pediatrician that was in there, he, everybody, I could see that. Because that's sensing that something is, is not right. So they closed me up and moved me into 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 a stretcher and removed to that theater kitchen and uh, that's when the the pediatrician comes to me and says um, unfortunately baby O didn't make it I refuse to accept that then I asked if they could bring him I held on so tight he was so warm and I squeezed in. Then I thought that little cry will come. I squeezed in, I held on. It was so, so perfect, so beautiful. It was like 3.7 kg and it was so big. And I couldn't believe that he, he was, I held on like very tight and with no strength I prayed like God. If there's a miracle that you've ever done for me, this is this is the one. They let me hold him for a while and until he then was declared dead. And uh, after that, um, my condition worsened. Um, it's funny how I, I I I remained in my senses and could even remember to detail. And I started biting my teeth. My blood pressure was sky high. I was shivering, like shaking, on the tape on the bed. So now they're holding me down and putting all these injections. I didn't even know what was they were putting into my system. So they moved me to to ICU. And they put the baby right in front of me on the incubator. I looked at that body and I was like, this baby cannot be gone. He, he, he was like, his eyes were closed as if he was just going to wake up and cry again. But unfortunately, that was it. That was it. Um, then uh, I had to call my parents. I couldn't tell my parents. Um, what had happened, I, c I was not in a position to speak at the time. They kept me uh, in ICU for, for a while. That afternoon, I was then taken to, to the gynae ward. So when I get there, part of my family, they are still in Venda. And uh, when I got to the ward, I, all I could say to mom, can you kindly come now? Um, I couldn't, I didn't want to scare my mother. Um, I mean, she's the one who dropped me for when I was being admitted. Everything was perfectly fine. So she comes with my sister and she looked at me once and before I could even say anything, you know. Then the nurses took her down for her to, to see the baby and to, to move the baby, to give them permission to move the baby. At that moment, I'm not feeling my body at all. Um, at that moment, I have six drips on me everywhere. Um, obviously, the anesthetic is, is still in, in, in my body, so my, my waist down body, um, 
was was just numb but my upper body was was freezing the cold but my blood pressure was sky high so even the doctors they didn't understand what was going on so the doctor that came in and did the c-section he stood there in front of me and it was like he was waiting for me to say yeah no she's not gonna make it to she stood there and looked at me i can still remember how he looked at me and When my family arrived, and my family from Venda then um, came through um, in support, um, and I really appreciate appreciate that because they made that whole process, that whole two days. I thought I was also going because they were scared too. Because I was just not in a good position. Um, I had lost a lot of blood. I needed blood transfusion, um, and now it's it's. It's a baby, we need to bury the baby, the hardest process ever. I can't move from my bed and now I had to rely um, from my family to make all the arrangement. And uh, part of, of what I had never spoken about through my pregnancy is, is the rejection that I had to deal with from my baby's father. When I was pregnant, everything was perfectly fine. Um, along the way, he then decided to say, I am not ready. Um, and uh, I couldn't have him, I couldn't terminate the baby as he was suggesting. I decided that I will carry the baby, I will take care of the baby, and I went through the pregnancy, and that was it. So when baby all passed on, and my family now, you know, this whole cultural thing to say, you know, when the baby's born, it's the baby's the father is and whatnot and whatnot. And I'm like, what about the pain that I had to go through with the same person? Nine months having to deal with the pregnancy alone. And now that he does not have a chance to come and rectify things. And why are we, are we now prioritizing him to say he must come now and now that this has happened? So... You are at a state where you can't get out from your bed, you can't even make your own calls, you can't do this. So your family are sort of making decisions for you. Now the baby had to be buried in three days. Um, I was not in a state to move out of hospital at all. I couldn't move from my bed at all. Um, I still had drips, my veins were collapsing. Um, I couldn't keep a drip for like two hours because my body was just exhausted. You know, they had to do even blood pressures from my legs because my upper body was just in tubes and everything. Yeah. Um, a day before the baby was was buried, so I asked for a, a pass out and the doctors were denying it to say, no, unfortunately you're not in a condition where you could be released for whatever reason, even if it's burying the baby because we could lose you. You are so weak. And I could feel that being a low blood pressure person and having lost so much blood, they then ordered blood and did a tr blood transfusion for the first time, like three pints. But my HP was not, my HP was not, um, was I think at four. And normal should be like plus 11. That's how bad it was. So when they did a, a blood transfusion with, with three pints, I was still not getting better. They did a, a day, the morning of the funeral, they gave me another pint and some drip that is called a venom. It looks like blood, but it's not blood. Apparently it increases the volume of blood into your system, but still that was not working. I said to the doctor, can you give me, it doesn't matter. If, if, if this is the last thing that I have to do on earth, then I need to see where my baby's buried. And I insist. So they gave me a pass. Um, it was terrible. I, I still had um, the the catheters because I couldn't go to the bathroom, and you know it it was just a nightmare. But at that point, it didn't matter. I needed to to hold my baby for the last time on earth, and I needed to be home with my family. You know, when you when when you lose a child and you have to moan in public, I felt like I had no I had not been given a moment to take it in. So at that point, I needed to just be home. Whether I could move or not, it didn't matter. So 
my family picked me up in the morning and uh, I was still looking all pregnant. I don't know what was happening. My, my, my belly was still as big as if I was still carrying. I got home. Now you have a, a, a very wet um, C-section. You are weak. Um, everything is, your face is swollen. I couldn't even recognize myself. That was the first time I saw myself in a mirror. And I looked twice. I was like, this is not me. But when I got home, I could see my uncles. Everybody was scared. You know, you know, handle with care. Everybody's fragile around you. It's, and the kids, the relationship that we have with the kids, that day they couldn't even run to me and hug me, maybe because of the physical pain that I was under. So we, my mom and my aunt, they go prepare the body in, in the mortuary, and uh, I couldn't, I couldn't make it. When the baby comes. And what saddened me the most that day was the same baby daddy whom has been given a chance to, to come and, and be part of the burial of the child. He then decides to arrive late for whatever reason. It's like it didn't bother him even then. You know. And I said to my mom, why are we bothering ourselves by wearing up for this person that clearly shows that he's not even interested in this? You know, to him, it's probably got what he actually wanted because he had ordered abortion at the time. And I refused. So now that the baby had passed, I guess his prophecy had come through. And my uncles were like, no, don't speak like that because you're angry. I was like, that is true. To him, he's happy. That is why he does not really care of being here on time or to be respectful. We went to, to the cemetery. On the drive to the cemetery, I was numb. It was like... This is not my baby's funeral. I'm in a car just going somewhere. I don't know what was happening. It was my mind and my brain. So I was like, ah, oh, yeah. And I was not even crying. I was so silent. I was sitting up straight and I'm looking as people were driving and so many cars. And when we got to the cemetery, I realized, oh, yeah, this is real. Like, okay, we're here to bury someone. The barrier continued. So I, I insisted to see. The, the grave. So I stood up from the wheelchair. I was I was I was on a wheelchair. When I stood up, something switched off when I was there. I, I just fell down. I, I felt like seeing that little coffin in there putting flowers in. I felt like this was it. Something switched off in me and I, I, my entire system like kinda like shut down. I, I just couldn't stand like it, it was just so painful. My heart was like in pieces. At that time, I, was, I had given up. I was like, that's it, Lord. This is too much. I endured the rejection, and I decided to have a healthy pregnancy, which God granted. And this, as a child of God, that had saved you my entire life. And this very same God that is awesome allows this to happen. At that point, something switched off and I fell and I just couldn't take it anymore. I was like, maybe I should have gone with him. Like, because I, 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 at that point, I didn't realize, I didn't see tomorrow. It was like, that's it. My world ended there. And to think that I need to go back to hospital again and and, and moan in public again and it, it it was just not worth taking another step or breath. It, it was like I'm ready, like let it happen now. But God of course he had his own plans. He I still believe that his revelation about that experience will, is yet to come. I'm yet to, to, to know or learn about it. Um but he allowed it to happen and uh, we came home, family's there, you look around, you still get to that point, it's like everybody's looking at you, you still, your bed is still big as if there's still a baby in there, you know. Uh, but knowing the fact that in a few hours the doctors are already calling to say she needs to come back because she needs another, she needs blood, she's not going to make it. 
I was taken back to hospital. What I thought would be a week stay in hospital after blood transfusion and my HB will be proper and my high blood will be okay, it ended up being a three and a half week stay in hospital. It was complication one after the other. I had what they call um, urine incontinency that hits you in different stages. At first I couldn't urinate, then I, I could urinate but I couldn't hold my urine. And then it was the whole clamping of the catheter process in and out. I probably have had catheters it removed and inserted like four or five times a day to a point where it was like terrible. My body was like injected everywhere. It was like I was using some substances because in injections everywhere and scars everywhere. But at that point it was like, ah, you guys are just bothering yourself. I'm done. There's no way that I'm going to make it through this. The doctor that did the delivery in theater a week later, uh, so the hospital had already organized when they realized I'm going to stay longer, they would already organized the, the therapist to come start my, my therapy sessions while I'm in hospital, which I really appreciated for them to have organized that. In as much as I felt like they were covering their backs because my baby, I thought that he died out of negligence because I've requested C-section like three times, but I was refused, I was denied. So when the doctor came a week and a half later, he, 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 he sat on my bed, he was very attentive. He came and checked on me every day, even if he was not um, his 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 turn to do the 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 guy knew what he would come in and check on me. He was Christian. I I only knew like later. He came and said a week and a half later, and he looked at me and was like, my face was so bad and swollen and all the dark marks in my in my face. It was like I was bleeding internally or something. And then he started touching me and just to check and checked my file and gave me an update and then he said do you pray and I said yes I do and he asked me did you pray that day I said yes I did and he started opening up about his fears after baby O had passed he said to me you were not looking good when I stood there and looked at you I was ready to sign your papers that you didn't make it to. Because you were so bad. And then I asked him, why is he telling me now? And he said to me, I knew there was something special about you. And he said to me, I knew there was something special about you. You prayed. And he said to me, you are going to be fine. He left. And then all the doctors that came to do the rounds, the, the chief doctor of the hospital came. They were trying to do all they can to get me up and going. But my body was just not responding. He said to me, you're going to be fine. He stood up and he left. And the other doctors that were doing the rounds, um, every doctor that comes, they ask you of your your progress, of your condition. And um, I was very attentive of what was happening in my system and I needed to read my own file to understand what was happening. And fortunately, my two older sisters are professional nurses. So when at that point I had my phone because it was now a week and a half later in hospital. So I called everything that was done on me. I had to call my sisters first before it was done on me to check if this is suitable for my system. I mean, they know the fact that I'm a low blood pressure person, my blood type and all those things. So um, I was checking with them to say, okay, fine. They, they putting a drip of this. What is this? What does that have to do with me? Um, with, 
I mean, how will it help my system and this and this. So they get on explaining. So when the doctors were coming to do the round, I knew exactly what was happening with me. So one doctor comes and he's he's making funny fun of me and he's like he asks about my condition so I explain I've been given this at this time and this and that and the catheter was taken off maybe because of this and this and that. So I, I this doctor stands there and he's like, You know too much. I win this <laughs> You know, it's like ah no man, I do my research. That's it. I just wanna be aware of what's going into my system. But I must say that all the doctors either they were being kind naturally or they were being extra kind mainly because of the negligence that I have experienced. Fine, all the doctor specialists were brought in, uh, I was not my condition was not changing. And my my C section was not actually recovering as, as normal. I mean C section by day three apparently you should be up and, and, and about but I, I just couldn't move. I couldn't even sleep straight on my bed on my bed on my bed. So they now it's it's week three. They have done all the the scan, the X rays, you know, there's this um terrible medication they inject when they do a, a, a an X ray. But it's not like a, a just a typical x-ray they wanted to see my bladder if everything is, is properly um, positioned if it's not damaged and that that medication is terrible it puts you down the whole day afterwards you can't even stomach anything i went through all of that trauma and after the every, every third day then they would bring a therapist and i would i would talk and then i asked my sisters to to buy me a journal i started my therapy session through my journal so third after the fourth week when we were going to the fourth week they're like no now we have done all we could in this hospital we now need to transfer you to um charlotte mcclaggy which all the specialists are there and i was like was i i am able to get out of my bed now to take myself to the bathroom and as much as now there's this catheter situation that i still need to battle can i go home they're like no you're not even my hb at the time is not even getting to eight they're like, you probably need another blood transfusion. And this and they're like, okay, fine, let's do a blood transfusion now. Then I go home and become an outpatient and, and make appointments for me at Charlotte McGuire. I will, I will, my family will take me there. I just don't want to be in hospital anymore. I need to be home. They kept me for two days and then they released me the third day. Um, and they'd already made all the arrangements of all the other appointments that I needed to go for the CT scan and all that. When I went to, to Charlotte McClaggy for a, a CT scan, it's the same medication again that they, they put you on and they come up and say, we don't see anything. We don't actually know why you're not recovering. So it, it's been a three months of torture and I have not started, I felt like I was cheated from starting the mourning pr process like as it happened because now I was focusing on my physical wellness. When I went for the first appointment, they said, no, we can't see anything, but this is the process. They've taken me through the process and obviously the bladder, um, when my stomach started coming down, even the bladder um, started to, to, to come down. Apparently it was swollen a bit. And when they showed me the pictures, all these medical terms, they say it didn't make sense to me. It still doesn't make sense to me when I look at these things even today. But um, when I came out of hospital, first thing, my, my mom would probably be shocked that I did that when she watches this. I was released and I went to stay with my mom, of course, because I couldn't do anything for myself. Um, my car was at my mom. When my mom went to work, um, my grandmother had just went back home to say, oh, no, I can get up. I, I was like, no, you guys need to go. Because I felt like I was being babied and I needed to just be alone and scream and cry and, and just let it out. And I couldn't do that because the minute I'm sitting alone or the minute they hear me crying, they come and, you know, they comfort me. And I just needed to have a moment where I can just cry and just let it out. So my grandmother stayed there for a month. And then the day she left, um, I was like, okay, she's leaving in the morning. Okay, when I had it all planned, my mom is going to work. I'm going to be alone. That day, everything just came back. But I took the car keys. I went to the gravesite alone. 
when I got there, I think that healed me. That sort of willed me to, to, to my healing process. When I arrived at the, at the cemetery, next to my baby's grave, there was a baby also that was born and died the same day as baby O. And I started reading, going through that line to see the dates, to check the dates. And what that did to me was, that made me realize that this, there's a whole lot of these mothers of the kids that were born on the same day that are in my position right now, that are crying as I am right now. What could be wrong? What is going on? I wonder which hospitals where these babies were born. So I started feeling for these parents that I didn't even know by just checking the dates. I left the gravesite crying, but I think that gave me a bit of light to say you're not alone in this situation you are not the first one when you look at the graves before there's there have been parents that ha are mourning their kids and you're surely gonna come out of this so i went home um i got home i didn't even tell my mother that i went to the grave side alone in that condition i got home and i slept i would stay in my room and cry and cry and cry for weeks and weeks and weeks i stayed at my mom's for like three weeks after hospital to a point where I was like, Mom, I need to go to my house. And obviously, you know, the, the family w wouldn't let me until I'm, I'm at a position where I'm able to to go up the stairs or walk around. And so now, But I insisted, and I'm like, Mom, I, I need to have this moment. I need to have a chance. It's going to be tough, and I need to learn it now. I need to, to, to deal with this head on. They allowed me to go with my cousin, um, my late cousin now and they would visit come help me clean for me cook meals for a week and but i insisted that i needed to be home um because when i went to hospital the house was already set for babies old arrival the beds everything the car seats all the clothes and everything was there at mom's there were all, all other clothes that people were bringing and now i had to deal get home and deal with unpacking baby O's clothes. That was the toughest thing ever. I couldn't sleep in my room. I had to sleep on the couch where things, all baby O's things were next to my bed. I couldn't move them. I just slept on my couch for a while, but now you have a C-section. You, It was just, I was not functioning at all. But it took me a week where I decided to, to stand. And I'm like, Lord, at that point, you know that prayer when you're a Christian, but you're praying because you don't have any other option. You're not praying mainly because you, you, you really feel that, yeah, God is, is the I am. At that point, I'm questioning a lot of things. My faith was shaken at the time. At that point, I'm like, God, I've saved you with my life. Yes, falling pregnant without being married to this guy, it, it is a sin. And this is where I am now. You know, I pray for forgiveness and everything, and the baby, now it's gone. But how do you let this happen? You've taken me from so much in my in my difficult childhood, and I saw you like planting my feet on higher ground, no question asked. But now, with this one thing that I waited for for 20 years, and you're like, no, this is not it. It almost felt like. You know, when God wants to cut all connections, it, it almost felt like that. That, okay, fine, baby daddy decided to do this. Okay, fine, maybe let me just cut all connection with this human being. It felt like that. I felt like God was being too harsh at that point. I was not praying. It was like, oh, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. And I closed, I shut, I shut up, and I just carried on with my life. It felt, I felt so empty. You know, I remember... The week, the day that I was um, released from hospital, there was another lady that was admitted, and she came in. She was playing the song, oh, yeah, la, le, la, oh, so. and I asked her to switch it off. And she turned and she looked at me. She was like, "Why?" Oh, I'm like, "Ah, oh, you know, I'm just trying to fall asleep." But meanwhile, she's playing a song. It's it was like she was being sent to remind me that in the most difficult situation, God remains God. Whether we agree with what had happened or with what we're going through or how it had happened, he remains God. She kept on playing that song. 
she, it was like she was annoy, she was sent to annoy me basically but that song even now when i listen to it i i picture myself asking this lady to switch it off but now when i was alone at home i played the same song i downloaded the song i was playing the same song but i'm listening to this song and i'm like was this song written for me at that time you're singing along because yeah you you, you know you're in ministry you can sing you're singing along you sing along it's not even sinking in the message is it's just you refuse it's like you're blocking this message to penetrate you to say yes this is in this situation you still listen to the holy spirit but at that point i was asking myself what am i listening to here i'm not getting this message this is too harsh i understand but this is too harsh in this way though god um it got to a point where i think i decided to wake up and i went to church and when i got to church uh, my lady pastor was like oh my goodness you made it to church and i was limping and i was like i'm gonna make it to church that why I, w I woke up and went to church that day, trust me, even today, I, I, I don't know how. I even drove myself. Got there, I, had no, I was not back to work yet, and uh, probably at work they were thinking, oh, this person must be back at work, she can get, up, get around and this and that. But it was like operating on autopilot. You know? um, but being at church that day, it was like, yeah, you, you're used to church, you go to church. You know, I mean, church... Um, was very supportive throughout the process you know the pastor the lady pastor the church members you know they were there by my bedside all the time and that and I think they carried me at the point where I had no strength I actually didn't want to hear anything about God and they kept on coming they kept on praying they kept on and their prayers actually willed me to like that day I'm gonna wake up and go to church when I got to church and uh, the lady pastor had say no um, we would like to to pray for 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 someone that is really going through a lot and obviously i knew that lady pastor knows what i'm going through you know when you are in so much pain you 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 can't be cute with crying like there's that cry that comes even when you are in public you just let it out you're not worried about what people will say or how you look you just let it out and that morning it was it it was like a whole lot of weight had started to be lifted off my shoulders. So I went back home. Um, excuse me. We were nearing my return to, to work. And I knew that my return to work, it's going to be a lot of work, a lot of traveling. And I didn't mind that. I think kind of when I was ready to go back to work, um, it was like, yeah, no, I need a distraction. So I used my work at that point as a weapon of destruction because it gets to be very hectic. You're planning one thing after the other, you're on the road and this and that. And I remember my therapist saying that, and I, at that point I was still carrying on with my, with my therapy sessions. I had my therapy sessions over, over a year, I think. It was, it was more than a year because some sessions I would get them telephonically as well. So that really helped. But throughout, it took me a while to get to a point where I would say, yeah, I've accepted it as well. It took me a while. And the day that I decided to say the words, it is well, it was God's will. I started going about my, 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 my grieving in a positive way. I started thinking, prioritizing myself with the little things, whether it's just take a walk. You know, I, I, I run quite a lot, but running at that time, I was... I was um, intentional about it I just needed to deal with leg pain and exhaustion and that would have taken me off thinking about the baby so I used a whole lot of um, um, things to to not think about baby O's passing 20, 2018 um, October on my birthday I get a call um, to say I have been nominated as the South African um, AC Sports Awards for Administrator of the Year. So this was my third nomination because I've won it in 2015. I was nominated again in 2016. 
In 2017, I received the Ministerial Recognition Award at the G Sports Awards. So 2018 um, was now a, 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 a fourth nomination again. And I'm like, oh my God, how funny are you? Right? So birthday present was like, oh, super. We're excited now. You know, God is starting to, to change the cycle now. The season is changing. So November 22nd, I'm like, mom, I, it's your turn now. We have to come along, you know, experience um, why I'm always away and what takes me away from home. So we get to Bloemfontein with my mother. At that point, I just needed to give my mother the experience of the sports awards. You know, whether I won or not, it just didn't matter at the time. So my mother was super excited, you know, so it was the first time being in an award ceremony like that. And you know, when you go there, they hyped up everything and you know, you're walking in, here's Virginia and her mom and they're looking this, so my mom was super excited. So with me, I'm just minding her and I'm like, this is your day, mom, just enjoy it. Fine, we get to, we get seated, the award ceremony starts. So the administrator of the year is the second award of, of, of the evening. So, okay, administrator, I'm, I'm not even paying attention to my mom. And apparently the, the, the gentleman that was sitting next to me on my side, she could, he could see that my mom was praying at the time. I'm focused on the screen. I'm not even paying attention to what was going on to her. She was like sitting there praying that she was praying. And administrator of the year 2018, it's Virginia Mawas. I was like, what? I actually got in, I took off my shoes. And you know when you're not expecting to win? I sat down and I took off my shoes. When they called me, I now have to try to find my shoes where they are. It's so dark and I'm running. So I got up on stage and I was like, oh my God, you're so funny. At that mo moment when I was hugging uh, the, the presenters of the award, I was like silent. I was like, God, you're too funny. Okay, get the award, you know, say the speech. And you know, I spoke too long and I was super excited. And uh, the cameras kept on spotting my mom because she was like, she wants to, she, she had told her entire family that she's going to come, um, she's going to be on TV. So, you know, I asked the SABC and, and Super Sport, like, please spot my mom, just, even if it's just for a second, you know. Um, but yeah, they kept on um, going to her and, and her wish came true. And um, we went backstage, you know, the excitement when I was backstage and they're doing all the, the interviews and all the medias are, you know, all eyes are on you. And I was sitting there on that couch with Oli and I'm like, my goodness. Is this for real? Like how funny God can turn things around, you know? So 2018 ended up with, in, with a bang, you know, a, a, an award. I mean, you are recognized at national level. This is not anything small and not the first time. So that means that the work that I do with the community around as I grow the spot of rowing and teaching the nation to row, that means that um, we, we are on the right track as a federation. Hi, my name is Funi Virginia Mabaso. I've been through the most.